just a few announcements before we start this morning. Um, Sanctity of Life, that's uh, for the Brenham Pregnancy Center, will continue to go on. Uh, we're getting toward the end of that, but there are still some uh, baby bottles out here. So pick that up, and the idea is to use that to put spare change in, or you can put a lot more than that in, but uh, that's in the minimum. Also, the uh, just uh, kind of as a conclusion, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering ended last week. Uh, the church raised seven thousand three hundred and four dollars and fifty six cents. So that's very good. That's very good. Uh, on February twentieth, the uh, home group that uh, meets over at Benita's house, uh, they're going to sponsor a movie here at the church called Show Me the Father. Uh, plan on coming at 6 p.m. for a meal and popcorn in the fellowship hall. And if you've never come to one of those, it really is an enjoyable time of fellowship. So I encourage you to come. That's February 20th at 6 p.m. Uh, a couple other items. First of all, there is a lost and found in the welcome area in front. Um, not that anybody would ever lose anything, but uh, anyway, just if that happens. It's near the children's entry, so that'll be, uh, as you come in, it'll be to the left, as you leave to the right. Uh, and the last thing is, uh, after the church serves today, is the quarterly business meeting. It's just an exciting time of fellowship and uh, get together. No. It's, it's, uh, it's an important time for the church to get together, so I encourage you to stay and to understand more what really does go on in the church. It's an important part of a Baptist church, and so uh, I encourage you to stay with that. And there's lunch. Yeah, yeah, the most important part. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> yeah, we don't want any angry pastors. Sure. All right, good morning. As you can recognize, I am not Brother Randy. I am Kathy Wilson. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Chapel Hill. And we're going to stand and sing. So this is when you have to use your hands on. on the bread and we're going to sing about the blood a lot ready this is an oldie buddy goodie let me hear you ready what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood
down. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing for sin at home, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not a good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing it. It's me white as snow. No other felt I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. All right. Now we have a blessing for you. Come on, friends. Let's sing. This is my brothers and my sister. Sit down. You may sit down. You don't want to stand up during this. Unless you want to stand up and give a pause, that'll be fine. Okay. All right. This is Sister Jane Knowles, Brother Ray Knowles, and Brother Ray Morse. One and two. One, Ray one, Ray two. All right. We're going to sing for you. Ray and (laughs) X-ray. Yeah, Ray and X-ray. All right.
has surrendered and earth is no more. I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. Okay. The X-Ray Quartet. <laughs> oh, what a blessing. Thank you guys so much. I know you worked on that all week, and uh, we appreciate you sharing your talents and sharing that message with us. If you're visiting with us today, we want you to know that you're entirely welcome in this place. This is the Lord's house. This is body is gathered here today. And uh, we want you so much to be a part of that. If uh, you'll give us an opportunity, we'd like to greet you before you get away. So uh, don't, don't run off. This is a friendly, good, uh, friendly bunch of folks, but we're not aggressive, okay? We just want to say hi and get to know you a little bit, uh, a little bit better. This passage is Matthew's account of the institution of the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper, as it was called then, because it was the Last Supper that Jesus would have with his disciples. This is out of Matthew chapter 26, beginning with verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations uh, for you to eat the Passover? Jesus replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. And Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not ever been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, you have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Father, may you bless the reading of this word today to our minds, our souls, and our bodies. Lord, we come to you today trusting your forgiveness of our sins, and we confess to you that we are sinful people. But Father, we want to live for you. We want to live like you. And we pray today as we meet together to celebrate your supper, as we meet today to celebrate our fellowship with one another and our fellowship with you, that we might be equipped and fit to live each and every day for you and with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Right, so then they sang some hymns, so we're going to sing two more. And this one is found in your hymn book on page 652, if you'll stand. We're going to do the first, the second, and the fourth verse. You probably know the first verse without even looking. And uh, having the privilege of trying to orchestrate how the Spirit wants things to happen, I always like to include something that the children 
know fairly well and that the adults don't know very well. So we're going to sing this one together. And uh, let's think about the words. Pretty incredible words. Ready? Jesus loves me, this I know. Father God, oh, this is fun. This is so good to be in your house with brothers and sisters. And I thank you, Father, for allowing me to be here today and have this privilege. So now, Lord, as I attempt to sing this song, uh, may I be out of the way. Let your words speak, speak to the hearts that are here. In your name I pray. If you'll focus, please, on the memory table instead of me, it'll help me. <laughs> All right, then. Okay. 
this one. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was, I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. You made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. There at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Chains freed my soul for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of hope. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved. You took my place, laid inside my empty tomb. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And death now has no sting. And life, it has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, you have washed me white.
sing it again. Lord Jesus, My, my, what a wonderful song, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you for that. Kathy Wilson leading our music today, and we appreciate it so very much. Randy and Sherry went to a reunion at their, their former church down in Houston. But uh, we, uh, we, we appreciate you leading us in worship, not just in singing, but in worship. The Lord's Supper has divided Christians for almost 2,000 years. And those of you who come from other traditions may think that Baptists do things a little bit strange. And we Baptists who have gone into your churches, when you have celebrated, think that you do things a little strange. <laughs> and we're strange people, all of us, aren't we? Something that was given to us the unity of the disciples and Jesus on that night before he died is something that we have taken and made it into almost a competitive thing to say we have it right. You know the amazing things about the Lord's Supper or communion, okay, or the Eucharist is that there are very few directions given in the Scripture about it. The hints are very small, and most of the things we have done over all of those years that have separated us have been things that we have invented on our own. I guess Jesus knew it would be like that. And even today, he is saying, Father, they still don't get it. But today, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture. It just hasn't been in the 2,000 years since. It was very early in the history of the church, that the differences appeared. If you have a copy of the scripture, you might want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to start at verse 17. The, uh, the text will be up on, on the board. Paul's writing to that church in Corinth that he, <laughs> he spent so much time with. He, uh, he wrote letters, uh, at least three, maybe four, uh, they're gathered uh, for us in, in two sections, in First and Second Corinthians, in our, our modern version of the Scripture. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for I hear your meetings do more harm than good. Now, up to this point, he has already talked about controversies within the church. They were divided over who their leaders was were some liked Apollos, some like Paul, some like Peter. And he spoke to them about that. They were divided in their membership. They were divided over things that they did with their body. They were divided over what they ate and how it was related to the pagan worship in, with which they lived. And so when he gets to this, after a fairly long discourse on the other things, he hammers them pretty good. <laughs> I have nothing good to say about you. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. My goodness. Can you imagine that? And to some extent, I believe it. Isn't that interesting the way he says that? Okay. This, this, is, this is fake, what he's saying. You know, I might even believe that he knew they were divided. And he's adding to the criticism by saying, and I may even believe it as well as I know you. 
No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Now, some folks have, and some interpreters, in fact, most interpreters down through the years have said, there's a reason why we have differences among us. It's so we can come together and see God bringing us together instead of our own ideas. And it's important for us to have different ideas about maybe what the scripture says or how our theology brings those things together. But I confess to you, I've got an understanding of this verse that I don't think anybody else has ever, ever brought up. And it worries me sometimes when I read the commentaries and they don't say this either. But I, I believe this was a sarcastic remark. Yeah. Yeah, I know why you have differences. That's so that, so that you folks over there can feel better about yourselves or feel like God approves you or, or over here. Those differences make you feel all pumped up because you have, have you ever been around Christian folk that are like that? Their understanding of the scripture is the best. The version of the Bible they read is actually the one that Paul and Silas read. And I just, for some reason, in my old age, maybe I'm getting feeble in my understanding, that just kind of jumps out at me and him with, with Paul say, yeah. Yeah, you got all these divisions so some of you can feel better about yourselves than others. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, even though it said that in the bulletin. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and, a, and another gets drunk. Now, this is the first thing that he mentioned, that some of them go ahead. And there's several reasons that may have happened. It was a common thing for, for Gentile households to get together regularly to celebrate. Now, sometimes uh, it was a memorial service for one who had died uh, maybe a year ago, and they would, they would get together and celebrate his life again. It was an annual thing. Sometimes they would get together uh, to celebrate some of the feasts around them. Sometimes they would just get together because it was good to get together and eat, a, eat each other's food, okay? But they would come together, and, and it wasn't just the church that did that. But the church was different than all the other groups because the other associations, so to speak, were people who were like-minded in interest. They were like-minded in socioeconomic uh, status. They were like-minded in the things they did uh, at work, or they were like-minded in the wealth that they had. And so when they came together, it was pretty much the people that you were with were just like you. But in the New Testament church, it wasn't that way. There were rich folks and there were poor folks. And there were people all in between. Or folks who had government jobs and folks who were slaves. It was an amazing association that was completely out of character with the culture in which they lived. And it was something that must have pleased the Lord to know in. You look at those 12 disciples that he picked. What a range of folks that he had in there. The Lord has always loved diversity among his people. He made us. He must love it. But what had happened in the Corinthian church, and it may have been this way, the rich folks who didn't work, they just live off of their, their investments. They would get there and bring a lot of food, and they would start eating. They would start nibbling on the tables and with the nachos and the uh, chips and salsa or whatever, and they would start ahead. And by the time the poor folks got there who had put in a hard day's labor, sometimes the good food was gone. Or it may have been that the way they gathered in those days, the, the, the Greek and Roman houses, there would be a, a gathering room, which is where the folks who had probably brought the food and all would go. And then there was an atrium, and then there was an outside courtyard. And usually it was arranged according to social status. The haves stayed inside. The have-nots, atrium or courtyard. 
And so what Paul is, is, is perhaps addressing here is, look what you've allowed to happen. Instead of welcoming everybody into one body, you have allowed your social status again to divide. Verse 21, when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. And as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? In other words, if you're that hungry, eat something before you come. And the rich folks could do that. Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? I suspect that the people on the inside really didn't understand what they were doing. Most of them had never been in that position before because they were lifelong, well-to-do people. They had been born into it. And they didn't understand what it was to look on the, look from the outside in. And so Paul here is trying to make them understand that they have humiliated part of the body of Christ, people that they welcomed in, people that they knew Jesus loved and loved Jesus. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. Some folks read this passage as saying that Paul had a direct revelation. I, I'm not sure it says that uh, because uh, this had been passed down through the church by the Spirit. There probably had not been any Gospels written at this time. Maybe Mark. Some folks say maybe John. Maybe none at this point had been recorded on paper. But the truth and the facts of what had happened on that last night had been shared as the disciples dispersed across the countryside and shared with the churches what that experience had been. So he says, I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, the title of the sermon today is for you, and I picked that little, that little phrase out of this passage because it's important to understand that this was given for us. It's not about the theology. It's not about the appropriateness. It's not about the, the church structure or the hierarchy or anything else. It's about the Father through the Son giving us something that will bring us close together and close to Him to remember what He did for us. It's given for you. The sacrifice Jesus made on the cross is for you. The memory for you. His blood for you. His body for you. The symbols that we used to celebrate for you. And the you here can be understood plural or singular. For you, Frank. <laughs> or for you, First Baptist Church. All right. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Something was added here as the church. This, actually, this is the first recorded instance of the church celebrating the Lord's Supper. The other occurrences in the Gospels are the Last Supper when Jesus was there. And so we get kind of a feeling and understanding of, of, about what they were doing, but, but they were beginning to realize that Jesus was coming back. They had thought he was going to be back the next day. They had thought he was going to be back next week. They thought he was going to be back next year, and he didn't come. And so they were beginning to see that the rest of their lives perhaps could be spent anticipating his return. And so the celebration of this supper wasn't just about the past. It wasn't just about the cross. 
it wasn't just about the blood or the body. It was about the visible return, the bodily return of the resurrected Savior who had come to take them home. It was about the future. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. We don't, we don't read that sometimes as we do the Lord's Supper because it's, it's not inconvenient. It's downright scary. We shouldn't come and do this in a way in which our minds or our hearts or our bodies are unfit to do it. In a moment, we will pray together. And I'll offer a prayer for this congregation, but each one of you offer up to the Lord. Confess your sins to him. Now, some of us may not have enough time to do that. I don't know. But anyhow, we need to confess our sins to him and to lift them up, trusting that those sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. You see, we can never be worthy of what he did for us. The sacrifice that he gave makes us worthy. It's about the blood, isn't it, Kathy? It's about the blood. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, and here it's not so much the physical body or the bread of Christ, it's the body who we are. Without taking into account our relationship not just to him, but also with each other. We are the body of Jesus. And therefore, when any one of us does something that hurts another, it hurts the whole body. That's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Wow, you talk about something hard to understand or interpret. A lot of times I've left that out because I don't want to address it to tell you the truth. But the fact is, what Paul says there is something that we need to reckon with. And evidently, the Corinthian church had had some folks get sick, and evidently they'd had some that passed on. And what Paul is doing is saying, maybe the reason that happened is because They had done something against the body of Christ. That's why you're sick. That's why some have died. And maybe the next time you take the Lord's Supper, you need to think about setting these things right in your heart. It's not a threat, okay? And Paul's not saying everybody that died is somebody that took of the bread or wine unworthily. Not everybody that's sick is like that. You cannot make a theology out of that, please. But he's simply saying that what we do as the body of Christ has and should have a powerful impact on who we are. Some of you may have had effects in your body when you have abused it by the things you eat, by the things you drink, by the things you have inhaled, by the fact that you don't exercise. Anybody feeling guilty? Or should I go on? All right. Abuse the body, you pay a price, don't you? And we've all been there in some respect. And Paul's pointing out the serious consequences to us and to the body if, in fact, we don't respect the body that has been given to us. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Paul has a good way of finding positive things. He's saying even discipline will help us in the long run. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. That's always been important to me. 
We all eat together. And today, as the deacons distribute the elements, we'll take our cups, we'll take the wafer, and we'll eat it together. We'll take the cup, and we'll drink it together. It's important that the church be together as the body of Christ. Anyone who is hungry, you should have already eaten so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. We don't believe that this is the actual body of Christ. We don't believe that this is his blood. But we do believe that it symbolizes those things. And as we take them and share them together, we are remembering in the deepest part of our souls what he did for us. We Baptists would always want to kind of move away from the mystical understanding of what happens in this meal. And by doing so, we have cut ourselves off from some wonderful experiences of what symbols can do in our lives and hearts as they represent the reality of what Jesus did for us. We need to move beyond that. The bread. He says, this is my body broken for you. And as he did, he tore off some and handed it to Peter. Peter tore off some and handed it to John. I don't know the order they were sitting in, okay. But as it ran around the table, somebody tore it off and handed it to Judas. It's Judas's decision to take that bread in an unworthy manner that night. But Jesus didn't stop him from doing it. He allowed him right up to the very end to do the right thing. And so the bread that's broken for us represents what Jesus did on the cross. His body was pierced by the nails and pierced by the spear. His blood ran out side down on the ground. And it was given for you. The earlier Christians were sometimes called cannibals because they talked about their love feast and drinking the blood of Jesus. Well, they, they probably weren't the most careful people in the world. They might could have said it a little bit better, been a little more circumspect in, in how they shared what they were doing. But we Christians have not always been the most careful and circumspect about saying things uh, out in public. I'm not sure that's a bad thing, but, but they got a bad reputation for what they did. But let's not shy away from the symbolism that's in this cup. This is a red liquid in here today. And it represents the most precious thing in all the world. If you've ever had a blood transfusion, you understand the importance of that. If you have ever given blood that someone else might have a transfusion, you understand how important it is. They can't give you anything else if you need blood. Nothing else in all this world will sustain life but blood. You can get skin grafted on. You can get artificial skin. You can get eyes fixed and replaced and just all kinds of things. But not with blood. And the scripture tells us that the most precious thing in all the universe is the blood of Jesus. And the symbol we take today in that little bitty drop means that it's not how much you have for the blood, it's that you have the blood. There are a lot of Christians in this world that just want more blessings. They just want more and more and more. But the fact is, what can wash away my sin? 
one little drop of the blood of Jesus will do just fine. All of the power of God's grace and forgiveness is in that drop of blood. You don't have to have a gallon of it. The drop will do. And so today, as we take these little morsels and as we partake of this, don't ever sell it short for what it can do in your life. Don't ever sell it short for what it can do in the life of this church as we come together to celebrate his gift for us. Will you bow with me in prayer? And when we finish our prayer, I'd invite the deacons to come up and we'll serve you. Our Father in heaven, we come today thanking you for the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the connection that we have through our lives, through our church, and through all of history with our brothers and sisters who have celebrated this same meal for all of those years. Father, I, I confess to you that I'm a sinful man. And Lord, as, as standing before this church today, I confess that we are all people of sinful lives. Lord, there's nothing good in us worth redeeming. There's nothing that certainly matches the blood that was shed for us. But Father, we come today as redeemed people, as people of faith because of what you did for us, not what we have done for you. It's your giving that makes our redemption possible. And so, Father, as we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. We claim the washing away of all the blood of Jesus. We're sorry for the things that we have done that have not lived up to your commandments and your expectations. We're sorry for the things, Lord, that we have done that have violated and hurt other people. We're sorry for the things that we've done to ourselves. We're sorry for the things that we have done in the body of Christ that have been destructive. But we lift them up to you today, believing that your grace, your mercy, and your blood washes it all away. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A few deacons will wait just a second. I, I want to, can, can we get up to that last uh, I'll back up one one board. Yeah. At the top of that, it is his body for you. It is his blood for you. He proclaims the Lord's death until he comes. The elements of communion. Okay, in the next slide. Years ago, a fellow wrote this as a summary of what a Corinthian Lord's Supper is all about. This is something for you to remember. This is something for you to take with you today. Lord's Supper is about looking back to Christ's death. It's about looking in and self-examination. It's about looking up, fellowship with God. It's about looking around fellowship with each other. It's about looking forward to Christ's return. It's about looking outward to proclaim God's word to others. All because of a morsel of bread and a tiny drop of juice that reminds us of our close connection with the past, but are looking forward to the future. Okay. You Dickens come up, please.
I have not done a Lord's Supper with your deacons. And if we don't appear to be on the same page, it's because Mike's on the wrong page. Okay. And for those of you who are new to celebrating here uh, today, uh, you know, over these last few years, we have had the elements served in a lot of different uh, uh, ways. Some of them are, are so hard to get into that you almost have to get down on the floor and wrestle with it. But uh, you'll receive two cups. The bottom cup contains the bread, the morsel. The top cup uh, is, the, uh, is the juice. So if you could, when you get them, separate them, and we'll do the bread first and then the, and then the juice. If you don't get it quite right, that's okay. We're all family here, okay? We're all of the same body. Scripture tells us that on that night before he died, Jesus broke the bread and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And then he passed the cup to each one so that they might all take a sip, a common cup. We don't do that anymore. We don't have to because our commonness is not in the instruments we use, the elements we use. It's in the blood of Jesus that draws us together. The most precious thing in all the world. And that night he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Okay. Gentlemen, you may have a seat. The scripture tells us that that night after they had finished the meal, they sang a hymn. Well, we're going to sing a hymn. Actually, this is going to serve as an invitation today or a hymn of decision. Maybe some of you today that, uh, that simply have never been a part of the body of Jesus, the body and the blood, the bread and the wine, have never meant to you what it should because you've never been a part of the body. And so today I invite you, it's your decision. Jesus paid it all. God sent his son into this world, but it's your decision to take him as your savior. I invite you today to do that and come and share it with this old preacher, okay, if you would. And if you're looking for a church home, we'd say it's a pretty good place to serve the Lord together. I invite you today to come and be a part of First Baptist Church, Chapel Hill. Let's stand together and sing. today to present to you uh, Bill and Gwen Watson, who have come uh, declaring their intentions to unite with your church, and promise a letter from First Baptist Church Magnolia. Now, I want to tell you something. <laughs> Not yet, Bill. Oh, my. <laughs> I want to tell you something. It's a blessing when people join during an interim period in a church. Um, very often, folks, they want to wait and see who the new guy is going to be, okay? They don't want to commit anything just yet and see how directions go. 
This represents your faith in the Lord leading you here and also your faith in this church body and your the desire to serve along with these folks right here. And so we appreciate your vote of confidence as it is in the future of First Baptist Church. Okay. <laughs> And today at the business meeting, we're going to vote them in officially, as well as Frank and Fran Hunt. So uh, you have blessed us no end. And Julie and Zach, yeah, as well. We've got six that are, that are going to be official card-carrying members today. <laughs> oh, we get a card? <laughs> you didn't get your card, Ted? I, <laughs> sorry, but I don't have one either. All right. Uh, y'all, y'all will want to uh, shake their hand and spend some time, maybe uh, uh, give them a hug or whatnot, and tell them how happy you are to be here uh, when we finish. But you guys can go on back to your to your seat right now because we're going to sing that final hymn. Yes, we and are. In just a second, we're going to move to the fellowship hall and we're going to eat, have a potluck. That's New Testament stuff. I'm I'm serious. Yeah. That's what Paul was talking about. Uh, we're going to all eat together. None of us are going to eat outside. We're going to all be there together and celebrate the Lord's body together and until he comes. So let me, uh, let me say a blessing uh, for the food uh, as well as the fellowship. And then we're going to sing. Uh, doxology. Yeah, doxology. Yeah, yeah. Father, we thank you today for being able to celebrate. What an awesome thing it is to think that for 2,000 years, your people have been doing this. And so, Father, we thank you for letting us be a part, just a foretaste of what it'll be like one day when we all get to heaven. And Father, as we come around this meal and sit around the tables in fellowship today, I pray that you might bless the food to our bodies. You might bless the fellowship to our spirits and bless the love and grace that extends over this place, our souls. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go. Sing it out loud and proud. This is a great old song. Bless everyone around you. Ready? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. You're dismissed. Brother, I thought he was going to say something. <laughs> Thank you.